I'm Michael. I'm mheap on Twitter, if you want to say nice things about this talk. If you want to say bad things, just come and find me afterwards. Let's not put that on the internet. And I'm a developer at a company called DataSift. At DataSift, we process huge volumes of information. And we started out by having one guy sit there and read it item by item, but that didn't really scale, so we automated it. And we thought, if we're automating this, what else can we get away with? So this is my, my experience about automating the simplest things to the most complicated things we could find. So there's a couple of facets to automation. We're going to cover them today. We're going to start by taking a look at what automation is. We're going to go through a step-by-step -step guide to automation. Importantly, we're going to talk about making automation institutionalized. It's no good knowing how to do it if you're not allowed to. We're going to think outside the box. It's very easy to automate the simple things, but there's a lot more to it. Once you're convinced, we're going to, we're going to learn how to automate things. And finally, we'll take a look at a couple of useful tools that will help you along the way. But first, there's an SKCD. There's an SKCD for everything, and this is one of my favorites. It shows you how long you can spend automating something and still get a payback within five years. If something takes an hour every week, generating spending reports for the boss, if that takes an hour a week, you can spend 10 full days working on that. 10 days. And so long as you run it every week, it will pay for itself within five years. You can spend 10 days automating an hour's work. But, SKCD aside, let's just dive straight in. What is automation? A lot of people think that automation is something that's automatic, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. Take this command line tool, for example. Does anyone have any idea what it does? No, me neither. I made it up. But what if I did this? This is automation. You've automated away the command line parameters. You don't need to type them. You don't need to know them. Automation is a way to abstract a task to reduce institutional knowledge. And if it decreases the time it takes to run it, that's just a nice side effect. So why automate? The number one reason why we should automate is people. And when I say people, I mainly mean myself. Because people, they have the best intentions, but no time. They don't have tests. Um, when they do have tests, they don't run them. <laughs> Same goes for documentation. But perhaps the most important thing is that people are not deterministic. They can do the same thing twice and get two different outputs. Isn't this what computers were invented for? You give them an input, it gives you an output. It's going to be the same every time you do it. But what other reasons do you have other than people not being deterministic? What about you want to make more money with less effort? Who doesn't want that? What if your company wants less overhead in the day-to-day -day work that you do? Or perhaps it's less work-focused, and you just want to spend more time with your partner, with your kids, or, if you're like me, playing League of Legends. <laughs> but we're still not getting to the core of it. For me, automation is all about fear. The fear of doing something in case you break it. Fear costs money. It makes people reckless. It leads to bad decisions and bad productivity. If people are scared of making a change, they won't do it. You'll never progress. By automating the scary things, we can increase productivity and happiness in our development teams. Automation isn't about being lazy. It's about being efficient. And if that gets us to the pub half an hour early on a Friday, who am I to complain? So, we should automate everything, right? Like, we're sold. We've seen all the reasons that we should. No. 
you definitely shouldn't automate everything. You need to feel the pain. I have a great example of this. I once worked in a team where something would run fine for about three weeks, and then the server would crash. And it's because a program on there wasn't clearing up file descriptors, and it would run out, and the server would crash, and they'd go in and fix it. So instead of fixing the actual issue, we went in and we had the cron job that restarted it every four days. <laughs> it fixed the issue, but that is bad automation. Anything where you need to feel the pain, you need to feel it. You really need to get in there. It wants to keep you awake at night. You need to fix it. That is not a valid use case for automation. This one's debatable, uh, but I figured I'd put it in here anyway. I don't like automated security upgrades. I want to know what I'm installing on my box, what I need to restart. We had the big glibc update. Installing the package wasn't enough. You had to restart all the processes that used it. If you automate that, what's to say that you won't have downtime? Security upgrades are something that I personally wouldn't automate. The general rule is anything you need to see, that shouldn't be automated. Don't run them in a cron job. So if that's what we shouldn't, what should we automate? Everything else. Deployments, reporting, CRUD generation, anything, anything you can think of. If it'll save you time, do it. Now, I'm sure we've all got that one person in our company who says, no, automation's rubbish. Like, I don't like it. People that say things like, my system is too complicated to automate. We've, we've all heard it before. If that's true, you have bigger problems. Start thinking about it. Decompose your system into smaller parts that you can automate. Build pipelines, things that output data that feeds into another part. It's easier to test smaller units of code. It leads to less coupling, more stable code. Uh, less coupling and more stable code that is open for extension. Another common one that I hear is we don't have time to automate. Fair enough, but if you don't have time now, you're never going to have time. It's a short term pain for a long term gain. You need to put in the effort now to reap the rewards in the future. So, I can see it in all your eyes, you're sold on automation. You want to you leave right now? Skip the keynote. <laughs> you you, you want to go. You want to start automating things. You, you're fired up. When should we automate? We need to know when it's applicable to automate. It's not good going out tomorrow and saying, hey, this looks good, let's automate it, because it might not have a real business value. For me, I automate as soon as it makes sense to invest the time. If something takes a minute to do, I might wait until I've done it, what, a dozen times? And then at that point, I know it's uh, going to be a regular thing, and I'll start looking at how to automate it down to a few seconds. More complex things? I might have it in, in mind when I'm doing it the first time. I might be thinking, this feels like the kind of thing that is sufficiently involved and might come up enough that I should be automating this. If that's likely to happen, I'll probably automate it as I build it. This conference talk, for example, this is the first time I'm giving it. But you know that the next time I'm going to get the video, I'm going to sit in the front row and I'm going to watch it with you because, hey, I've done the effort. If you can do it more than once and it takes a significant amount of effort, automate it. So I promised you a step-by-step -step guide. This is going to feel a little bit counterintuitive for an automation talk, but the first step is to do it by hand. And this is very important. Make notes. The notes are the most important part, but you need to understand what you're doing before you can automate it. Once you have those comprehensive notes, you know exactly what you did. You copied and pasted every command into a text document. Then the next time you do it, you automate the first part. It could be, again, weekly reporting. If the first part of your weekly reporting 
is to fetch the data from a production database. Just automate that part. And then, once you've got the data, run the reports by hand, do whatever you need to do, email it on. And then the week after, you do it again. You automate the second part. You have the first part done. The data's just there. It's free. You don't have to invest any time. Now, producing the report, that's free. You've automated it. And if you follow this, step by step, you will automate your entire program until it's all automated. And then, on a Friday afternoon, all you have to do is go and press a button. Something that used to take you an hour has been built up bit by bit. You didn't need to sit down and say, hey, I need 10 hours to do this. You just did it, piece by piece. And now it's all automated. It saves you time every week. At this point, you're still running it yourself. That's very important. You need to keep an eye on the data, make sure that it's accurate. Because you're automating, it's going to do the same thing every time. That's, that's great if it's right, but terrible if it's wrong. And then once you're confident in the data, once you know it's sending the correct data out to people, run it, run it unattended. Put it in a cron job. The end goal is, the, is that you never hear about this report again, because it should just run in the background every week, and the relevant people get it. The only time you should hear about it is when something doesn't work, which is ideal. That's all. Five steps. It's not that hard. Take a look at the problem, do it by hand, work out what the problem is. Make notes, take a small chunk of it and automate it. The first part, then the second part. It's like the old joke, how do you eat a mammoth? One bite at a time. Topical, as you've seen the little elephants, right? If anyone's got one, I want one. By the end of it, you'll have a fully automated system that you can just stick in the background somewhere, and it will essentially do your job for you. So now we have a set of steps to follow. We need to find something to automate. And my advice here is start small. Automation can be quite daunting. If it's a huge project, find a small part, like the reporting, the fetching the data from a production database. Like that's a small part that you can automate today. Those small incremental improvements reap rewards. When you're looking for things to automate, start with the whining. What do people complain about? Find out what would make people's lives easier and start there. Deploying is too hard. Like, you can do that. I don't understand it. Is that because your deployment pro process looks something like this? They just they do it. They run it on the desktop. They might get things out of order. It is. It, when you understand what it does, it's not too bad. Assuming you type the right things, which I never do. But what could we do in this situation? How could we make this easier? People are complaining about it. It's prime for automation. The easy thing to do is just ignore them. But that doesn't get us anywhere. We, we could help. We could write a little shell script that turns this into this. It does everything for them. It's faster. It's more predictable. And all it's doing is running those commands We've gone from this to this. Start with the whining. Find the pain points in your organization and solve them. People might not thank you for it, but you're making everyone's life easier day to day. And given this example, you're actually reducing risk in your deployments. You're making a real difference to your company. So we've got this automation. We need people to use it. Going back to our deployment example, the script is better than the old system, but still not perfect. Some people are still doing it by hand. You're running version 4 of the script. Someone else is running version 7. How do you keep everyone on the same page, though? 
we need centralized automation. And thankfully, this is a solved problem. This is continuous integration, not code igniter. <laughs> um, continuous integration is out there. There's tons of servers. Jenkins is probably the biggest. We use Go CD. It really works for us. We've got Bamboo from Atlassian, Circle CI, Semaphore. I could go on. There's so many. There's going to be one that fits your use case. Continuous integration is generally used for something that looks like this. Your code changes, it runs the tests. But you can use it for all kinds of things. You can use it to spin up new servers to deploy features to, or for the QA team, or even in production. You can use it to generate regular or ad hoc reports. Instead of putting it in a cron job, put it in the CI system. Everyone can see it. Someone needs a report right now. They go in, they just press the button. It's not just for builds. Continuous integration is generally thought of, a build, thought of as a build system. But there's so much more than that. They're automation systems. They run commands that you specify, when you specify. That can be on demand. It can be at regular intervals, at a specific time. Or even when something else happens, set up a, a webhook from GitHub. Anytime code changes, it will do something. Continuous integration systems are just big automation engines. <coughs> but perhaps the greatest accomplishment of continuous integration systems are that they're not just continuous integration systems, they're centralized information systems. Anyone can go. It provides a centralized point of information and orchestration. I need something, I log in, I can see the last time we deployed to production. I can generate a report if I need it. Your coworkers can do the same. The scripts aren't just hidden away on your machine anymore. They're accessible for everyone. The business analysts, okay, Jenkins doesn't look great, but I'm sure they can go in, click the play button, and get the report out the other end. There's a great side effect of having all of this information be public. It gets people to take notice. Think about tests. You've got a whole set of applications. You've got 15. 14 of them are green, and one of them is, one of them is red. If no one can see that, does anyone care? But as soon as you have a lovely green screen, one block of it goes red. People are going to jump on that. They're going to say, no, that's my screen. I want it to be green. And they're going to fix the issue. Just by making things more public, people are more invested. So everything so far has been pretty standard. Automated tests, continuous integration systems, reporting. Point four is all about thinking outside of the box. This is us. We don't have to move far. Maybe it's here. It's not far outside the box at all. But how can we make our own lives easier by doing this? How many of you are using PHP 7? OK, so this bit's only going to apply to you. But dot blocks. Did you know that your doc blocks can be generated from scalar type hints? You don't have to write them yourself anymore. But did you also know that there are tools out there that can take those doc blocks and generate code from them? You can generate client libraries. Just by writing your code and working with the artifacts, the doc blocks, and that through another process, you can automatically generate client libraries for your applications. It's not something that I'd normally think of, but it's definitely possible. What about code generators? Most frameworks have them. Symfony has them, Laravel, Cake. They automate common tasks like CRUD generation for controllers. Why are we writing controllers by hand? There are tools out there that will do it for us. It's, it's a solved problem. 
they always have the same format, initially at least, anyway. So let something else take care of it for you. Now, we can use generators for creating new controllers, new entities, but before we even get there, we need a project. And we can use Composer, we can say, hey Composer, give me Symphony Standard Edition. And that gets you part of the way there. But what about all the other things that we inevitably go and add? Asset pipelines, things like Gulp and Grunt, test structures, we like to add codeception tests, BHAT tests, even things like seed data in a database. You have a skeleton project, you always have a user sign up. Wouldn't it be great if when you bootstrap a project, there's already an admin user there ready to log in and work with? Things like seed databases make a big difference when you're bootstrapping projects. These are all things that you would do anyway. These are all things that you do every time you spin up a project, so why are you doing it by hand? This can be automated. There is a downside to skeleton packages, and that's that when you notice a bug, and you will notice a bug, you've got to fix 10 different projects rather than one. And that's where composer packages come in. You can take the generic functionality, abstract it out, and add it as a dependency. You need new functionality? Great, add it to the composer package. You notice a bug? Great, fix it in the composer package. And then everything else just depends on it. By the end of it, your frameworks, uh, your framework, your projects should just be the minimum code needed for your business logic. But what if we go even further? Like the box is all the way down here now, and we're all the way up here. What if we think about some more crazy ideas? Fun fact, I used to play a space-based game online when I was probably about 15 or 16. It was called Evolution, and the way it worked is you bought land, but your first piece was 150 gold, your second was 300, 450, and so on and so forth. And when you're buying one or two pieces, it's not too bad to do that maths in your head, but once you start getting into thousands, it was quite tough. And this was about the time that a tool called Grease Monkey came out. And Grease Monkey lets you run user scripts, little pieces of JavaScript on any web page that you want. So we thought, actually, we can add a little box on the web page that tells us how many we can buy. We can automate that maths. We can write a formula and have it automatically shown. Long story short, I ended up maintaining one single 1,800 line file of JavaScript, but I did learn JavaScript. That's how I learned JS. Just trying to scratch an itch on a space-based game when I was 15. What about bank statements? We go online, we can see our bank statement. In 18 months time, you say, hold on, something doesn't look quite right here, and you want to go back. You say, oh, that might have been when I was in London at PHP UK. But your bank says, I'm sorry, we only support 12 months of statements online. If you would like a paper copy, that would be 15 pounds, please. What if you could write a script that every month logged into your online banking account, downloaded the PDF, and put it in Dropbox? It's not that far out of the box. But when you need it, it's going to be really useful. You don't have to pay £15 for the privilege anymore. I used to work at a startup, and we had this really cool idea where we were still quite small, it was slow going, but every time there was an upgrade onto a paid plan, we had this little speaker play a sound. It just went cha-ching, and it was wonderful, because everyone in the office knew that meant someone had upgraded. Yes, we could have sent an email out. We could have sent it just to the boss or to the entire team. But it's just something a little bit different. Everyone knew that that sound meant that we were doing better. Where I am now, 
we don't have that. In fact, we have the opposite. Uh, we have a big police light attached to the ceiling. And any time there's a critical production incident, that light goes off. It's crazy. Like, you see people flying down the office on scooters trying to get to the operations area, saying, what's wrong, what's wrong, we can fix it. But it would have been so easy just to send an email to the operations team. But by looking at the automation that we had and making it more visible to people, you get more people involved, more people to help. And finally, I've mentioned this to a couple of people, and they really like this idea. There's a tool called Selenium, which will let you automate web browsers. And imagine this. You press a button, and it fires up a web browser, loads up Selenium, navigates to your favorite takeaway, and orders you a pizza. <laughs> Why not? The tools are there. It's just about how you apply them. Your, your imagination is your only limitation. So I wasn't sure if I wanted to show you this bit, um, because you might think I'm a little bit crazy. But let's just do this. Yep, that's fine. So last year, I was making, I was producing a video series, uh, an educational video series. And I realized that I can't talk and type at the same time. It's really hard. So I started to plan out what I was going to do. So this is what I'm going to say. This is what I'm going to type. This is what I'm going to say. This is what I'm going to type. And what this is, this example, is it's a bowling cutter. So it creates something that represents a bowling game. And it writes a test for it to prove that we can instantiate it without an exception being thrown. Really simple. And then I got to thinking, if I'm writing this script, why am I the one reading it? Can the computer do it? Can I just get back and relax and talk? And it turns out, yeah, I can. This is an actual terminal. This is iTerm2. And it's reading my script on the right-hand side. Here, we're going to do what we're going to do next is initialize the compose.json file. That's a real Vim. How many of you knew that you could automate Vim? It has a server. You can remotely send commands to it. How many of you knew that you could automate iTerm? I didn't until yesterday morning, when I realized that I didn't have a Linux machine. But you can. There are tools for everything. Automator on OS X, XDo tool on Linux. Um, Vim has a client server mode. And it's just going to keep going. This takes about a minute and a half, a minute and 40 seconds. But look, no, no hands. It's just doing it itself. This was fantastic when I was doing the video series, because now I don't have to think about typing. All I do is I read my script. So then we create a test for that class. The first test we write just proves that we can create an instance without an exception being thrown. See how easy that is? I told you, you might think I'm a little bit insane, because how did I even dream this up? Like, what inspired me to think, oh, hey, I wonder if you can make Vim type automatically. It's not a question that comes up every day. But just by throwing everything out and thinking, that's not a stupid idea, like, anything is possible. Your imagination is your own limitation. Look at that, it, it passed the test. And I can go and load up Vim, load up the test. It's there, I'm, I'm poking around. It's not a video, it's the actual terminal. So, 
Point five is about actually doing it. You're convinced. You're going to go into the office tomorrow. You're going to say, we're going to automate. I saw this awesome conference talk, and he's really sold me on it. You're ready to commit. What do you need next? You need business buy-in. Automation is hard. You need hardware. You need people. You need time. You need to be ready for hard work. Automation isn't all unicorns and puppies. In fact, if you're anything like us, it will go a little bit like this, where two weeks in, you just you sat there, you think, you know what? This is the best thing ever. My workload's dropped, everything's working perfectly. And then about two months in, you start to think, actually, <laughs> this is a little bit harder than we thought. Then six months in, you start saying things like, can we just go back to the week-long test cycle we used to have where everyone just drops everything and does it by hand? But 12 months in, you're shipping so much cool stuff that you've forgotten the pain. At that point, you've done the hard work. Everything is awesome. Go for the quick wins. What really annoys people that we can fix with minimal effort? That's your first point of call when you're looking for things to automate. When you're doing that, keep it quick. Focus on immediate feedback. Sure, automating an entire end-to-end -end test on Jenkins is fantastic, but if it takes 18 hours to run, people are going to get bored. They're not going to wait to see if the test passed. Focus on the high value things. Focus on smoke tests. Your application, you care about whether people can log in, check out, pay for things. Do you really care if people can't change the profile picture? If you're a social network, maybe. If you're an e-commerce store, probably not. Still test it, but run it overnight in a nightly job. Don't have that as a blocker for your day-to-day -day builds. You need to make sure that everyone is on board. Adding a continuous integration system creates a commitment to testing. Are all the developers on your team interested in that? If the test coverage drops, does that fail the build? Yes, is an okay answer here but you need to get buy-in from everyone involved before you make those decisions. You need to be aware that automation is debt. You need to be prepared to maintain this work. Code is code. Maintaining this automation will take time. The key is to make sure that the time you spend maintaining this is less than the time it saves you. If it takes longer to maintain, then it saves you doing it by hand. You're in a false economy. It's a net loss. Don't be afraid to throw something away if it is a little bit too brittle and it doesn't quite do what you expect. It's only worthwhile automation whilst it's saving you time. Don't skip on your error handling. That's number one on my list of automation essentials. Expect failures. What happens if halfway through a push, the network disappears? What happens if you try and run something and the current user doesn't have permission? It's very easy to automate things to the happy path. You assume that everything will work, and when it does, it works perfectly. But when it doesn't, you need to be able to recover. You need to know what state your automation script was in, any diagnostic information, especially if it's running in a, in a cron job that you can't see. If it's running in an automated way, you need all of that information to work out what went wrong, to fix it and make sure it doesn't happen again. Item potency. This one is important. Can I run this multiple times and will it have the same effect? So one example is you have a script that creates your host file on a machine. And any time a new developer joins your team, they run that script, and they get all of your internal DNS servers, things like that. It doesn't matter how many times 
you run that script, it's always going to produce the same host file. It's that important. You have a script that emails out a voucher code to all your customers. You have a business rule that says we're only allowed to send it once per day to each customer. What happens if someone puts a store in the wrong place in the cron job? Will it send every hour? If that's the way that your script was written, that's what it'll do. Computers do what we tell them to do. But there are ways to mitigate it. By storing the last time that you sent that email, and in the script checking the last time, you could run it every second if you wanted to, as long as the logic in that script knows that it should only send once per day. If you can run it multiple times without having any bad side effects, if you can run it multiple times having the same action every time, it's item pausing. Build on the shoulders of giants. There's a lot of work out there already for automation. In the automation world, things are generally one of three things. A fetcher, a runner, or a scaffolder. We've already talked about all of these. Fetchers are good. You say, give me jQuery. That's fine, it downloads it, puts it in your project. But when you say, give me this specific carousel, it says, OK, I'll get the carousel. And then it says, oh, actually, that depends on jQuery, so I'll get that as well. It handles dependencies. Composer is a great example of a fetcher. It gets things that you need. Runners, they do the same thing over and over. You know, make, rake, cake. They all end in ache, unless you write JavaScript and then it's gulp and grunt. No, that's not right. Gulp and grunt. Um, I don't know why they don't end in ache. There is one called Jake, but they just like to be a little bit different. And finally, scaffolders, also known as generators. We talked about these earlier. Lava has them, Cake has them, Symphony has them. Anything you need to do can generally be built on top of these. If you're a Laravel developer, you may have seen Jeffrey Way's generators package. He went out, he saw the built-in generators are good, but actually I find that I'm doing this over and over again. So he built on top of the engine that was there. He built on top of the scaffolding engine that is built into Laravel and built his own stuff. Build on the shoulders of giants. They've done the heavy lifting. You only have to specialize for what you need. Now that we have things that can be automated, how do we trigger those? We can go in, we can run the script by hand, we can run it in the cron job, through continuous integration systems. But there's a couple of others as well. We can pull an endpoint on the web for changes. We can use webhooks from GitHub. Or we can use something like Zapier, or if this, then that. They're automation engines. I could set something that says, hey, if this, then that. Watch the weather for my location. If it's forecast to rain in the current day, send me an email before 8 AM. And I know how to pick, that I need to pick up an umbrella. That's automation. Something that makes my life easier. It's just a different way to trigger those things. I mentioned visibility earlier. Visibility is very important. For anything over time, I recommend using graphite. Draw it on a graph, put it on the screen somewhere. This could be the time at which you deployed last to production. It could be the number of 500 responses per minute. It can be anything that has a timestamp associated with it. If it's not time-based, stick it in an email. Have something tweet you. Put it into IRC, Jabber, anything. So long as you can see it. Personally, I'm a little bit partial to Slack. We send everything to Slack. I have entire channels as dedicated event streams. I have one channel that just shows all projects that I'm interested in at work. And it shows all commits, all pull requests. If people are changing projects that I'm involved with, 
I'd like to know. They're not always going to come and say, hey, Michael, we're making radical changes here. But if I can see that as soon as they made the first commit, I can jump in and say, oh, have you, have you considered this? Like, what happens with this integration work or that? That visibility is really important. Another channel just shows all the failed builds in the company. Anytime anything goes red, it gets put into Slack. People are already in there chatting away. They don't even have to look up at the screen anymore. It's in the conversation. You can even trigger things from Slack. It's not just a receiver. You can send things. You can trigger a deployment, create a pull request. There's a framework from GitHub called Ubot, which is fantastic for this. It's got all kinds of plugins. Um, if you're interested in it, go and have a look. Uh, the term that you want to be looking for is chat ops. It's a real thing where people run their entire development infrastructure, their production infrastructure, from chatting with a little robot in their chat channel. And finally, point six, the useful tools. There's so many out there that to cover even any of them in reasonable depth will be an entirely new talk. Um, but I just wanted to give you some ideas about what is available. Imagine that you join a company. What do you need to start doing your job? The first thing is you probably need a development environment, right? Vagrant and VirtualBox, perfect for this. A really easy way to get up and running. This works really well whilst you need one or two machines, maybe a web server and a database server. Developer environments at DataSift are a little bit more complicated than that. You know, we're now up to 12 machines for each developer. And Vagrant wasn't really working for us, so we moved to something called OpenStack, which is it's essentially a self-hosted version of AWS. All of Vagrant, all of OpenStack, it can be automated. They have APIs. You can automatically create, destroy these environments on demand. At this point, though, they're just empty machines. You need something like Puppet, Chef, Ansible. You need something to configure those systems, install the right packages, put the right configs in place, tell them how to talk to each other. By using these tools, you can define your infrastructure as code. It can be versioned, committed to Git, diff between two points, work out when a package or something changed. And this can then be run automatically on your Vagrant machines and your OpenStack machines to provide a complete developer environment. At this point, you have an environment. You probably need something to start writing your code. Yes, using an IDE for development is automation. Automatic dot blocks from scalar type hints. Did you have to type it? No, it did it for you. It's saving you time. But what about the less obvious things? Like in PHP Stone, if you go in and rename a method, it will go through your code base and rename all callers of that method as well for you. This is your IDE, automating your job away. There's liquid base for database migrations. Now, I don't have a huge ex huge amount of experience with it personally, but our JVM teams love it. They use it all the time. It's something that we're starting to look at in the PHP world in our team. Um, there's also things like doctrine migrations. Um, there's another one called Baloo, which I saw a talk at FOSDEM about, which looks quite interesting. Just choose something. Copying and pasting SQL commands into production isn't sustainable. You need something to manage the migration process. We have code or database changes. It's time to test and package it up. Use Jenkins, Team City, CoCD. Use whatever you want. Just have a CI system. That produces artifacts. It produces a, a zip file, an RPM, whatever, however you ship your code. It will come out of your CI system. 
you can use Amazon AWS and its APIs to manage integration environments, staging environments, production environments. You just need somewhere to ship those artifacts so that people can play around and test them. But the AWS APIs, they're not the friendliest thing in the world. So you probably want to use something like Terraform. Terraform is from a company called HashiCorp. And it lets you define an environment in an executable format. You can define an entire VPC, different subnets, different instance configurations, and have Terraform enforce that state for you on AWS and many other cloud providers. If you're automatically spinning up new resources, how do you keep track of them? You can use Console for service discovery. Console's another one from HashiCorp, as is Vagrant. Basically, anything they touch is gold. They have my seal of approval. When you spin up new things, they say, hey, Console, this is where I live. And when your application boots up, it says, hey, Console, where does the database live? It's all about the service. It's all about the services not knowing where each other live and having a central point that you can check in with. The advantage to this is if your database server goes down and you have to quickly change to a, a replica, console will handle that. Because your application doesn't have a hard-coded um, database URI, it will just ask console, and the next time console will give it back the new address. Whilst all these tools are available, don't underestimate the power of a small shell script. You've got Bash. You've got Python, basically everywhere, unless you're using CentOS 5, in which case you have my condolences. Um, but PH, uh, PHP, Python 2.6 is available basically everywhere. If you know that you're going to be working on a machine that has PHP on it, why are your scripts in PHP? Use the tools that you have available. They're just tools. And finally, Slack, again. I love it. It keeps everything visible. Something fails a build, put it in Slack. The pipeline that rebuilds your staging environment gets run, put it in Slack. There's an important meeting that people shouldn't miss. Have Google Calendar put it in Slack. If people are looking at it already, get it in front of them. We're coming to the end now. I can hear the sighs of relief. But there's just a few more considerations for when you're automating things. The first is, should it be automated? Manual things do have their place. Is it hard to test? Say you're testing temperature sensors in the real world. Is it easier to just do it manually? And we're going to do it less than five times anyway, so why invest the time? Or what if it's an extreme case that you can't reproduce anywhere but in production? A lot of that is probably going to be exploratory work. You're going to be investigating what's happened. You can automate that. There are certain situations that doing it manually is still the best decision. Security is a huge one. You need security policies. Automation is wonderful until you talk to your head of security and they say, OK, so what permissions does this user need? And you say, oh, it just needs to see everything. Yes, it might be read-only, but that's still dangerous. You should have the minimum permissions required to do its job. Pipelines. Split up your automation stages. Think in pipelines. Instead of having one large job, have five small jobs. For us, our staging release pipeline, um, it has five different steps. One that compiles cookbooks and makes sure that everything is OK. Another one that uploads it to the Chef server. Another one that runs Chef on these staging machines. If we run it everywhere, it takes about five hours, all in all. But that might be an hour of that is testing at the first stage. If that passes, but the network gets interrupted in the third stage, and we couldn't actually run Chef on all the machines, do we want to go all the way back to the beginning and run all the tests again? We knew that they passed. What's changed? It's the same code base. We want to be able to restart at that third point and say, OK, the network went away, but we can restart from where we left off. By splitting large jobs up into smaller ones, you can save yourself a lot of time. You can restart only the stage that failed. There's no need to repeat the bits that passed. 
And last but not least, implementation details. Don't expect to go out tomorrow and build the perfect automation system. Build for your team today. Start with the workflow and then automate it. Don't go in and say, oh, hey, I think we're going to be 50 developers next year, so this is what I think we should be working like at that point, so let's automate it. That's just not going to work. Go in, look at how you currently do things. Look at the actions that you do by hand. Build what your team needs. Do you need an auto-scaling group on AWS with multiple replicas of MySQL? And do you need it in multiple availability zones? Or do you need a single AWS instance to stick an application on so that your client can check it? Build what you need, and then add the cool stuff afterwards. If I was going to go out tomorrow and start automating something, I'd start with notifications. Even if it's just something that announces the time on the hour, at least then you've got the infrastructure there. And when you start doing things like report generation, one-click deployments, developer environment setup, you have somewhere to push all of that information. You can do deploy history and tracking, anything that you do more than once a month. Start with notifications. Look at the problems that you're facing, and the rest will follow. So, in summary, automation is awesome. It really is. It's a large upfront investment, but it pays for itself 10 times, 100 times over. Think in pipelines. Small, composable tasks that feed into each other. And finally, be very careful what you automate. There are some things that you shouldn't. Not many, but they do exist. I've been M Heap. You guys have been awesome. If you've got any feedback, I would love to hear it on Joined In, as would all the rest of the speakers. Um, we've probably got time for one or two questions. Yeah, any questions? Straight in there. Not entirely related to the automation, but do you have a GitHub for, you know, that thing you did with Vim? That was fascinating and very impressive. <laughs> Can we get a look at it? Um, so I actually wrote it about 12 months ago and then put it on Bitbucket because I can have free private repos that no one can see. Um, it's horrible code, but I do intend on polishing it up a little bit or even not polishing it and just open source it because I figure people might be interested having seen the demo. Yeah, I'll tweet it on the hashtag. Any more? Okay. I must have done a really good job then. Um, if you do have questions, I'm going to be around for the rest of the afternoon and the evening. I'm wearing the blue jacket, so I should be easy to spot. Um, just come and say hello, and I'll chat about anything. Cheers.